Let us open with prayer and we'll get right into the Word of God. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you've done. We pray that you receive that praise and worship, Lord, from our hearts. And now we will turn to your word, Lord God. Feed us from on high. Let your Holy Spirit lead us and guide us and teach us. In Jesus' name, we all sit together. Amen. 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 Thank you all for being here this morning. Thank you for participating. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. As I look around, I know we are familiar with this particular verse, but we do record and we do put this on YouTube, so somebody might not be familiar with this particular verse. And the more we learn it, the more we can share it, amen? That particular verse, <clears throat> Jesus Christ from heaven gave Paul this revelation, and it says in that verse, study, that's the first word of that word in the King James Bible. The first word is study. I love that because the Bible tells you to study. Now, a lot of people say, well, I'm going to Bible study. Okay, well, the Bible is going to show you how to study the Bible. Amen. Study to show thyself approval to God, a worker that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. When you study God's word, God will give you his stamp of approval. It will be some work. You put in the work, and that's usually why a lot of people don't want to do it, because it does take work. It takes time to study, to read, to compare Scripture with Scripture. But when you do this, the Bible says you, you need not to be ashamed. You don't have to be ashamed. You can understand God's Word. You can, you can share this with someone. Amen? You know what the instructions are from Jesus through the Apostle Paul. And that last part of that scripture says, rightly dividing the word of truth. I wrongly divided for so many years. I was under preaching who wrongly divided for so many years. But I thank God that when the time, when I, when I really began to take it in and study and really search things out, you really can rightly divide the word of truth. And those three major divisions is Time past, but now age to come. These are the phrases that Paul used in the King James Bible. Time past, he said in the Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. Ephesians chapter 2, 13, he says, but now. And then he says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7, he says, age to come. And it's real simple. Past, present, future. Past, present, future. In a relationship, it's very important to understand a person's past, their present, and their future. Amen? And it helps the relationship. Would you agree? It's like we're on the same page. The time pass system in our Bibles from Genesis to the book of Acts, mid Acts, it was a performance based system. And I'm going to give you a few examples of time past, but now ages to come. If you can turn with me really quick to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. I know you've heard me say it before. Time past, it was a performance-based acceptance system. You had to perform, amen? If when he said, thou shalt, that was you And it never said anything about the Holy Spirit helping you. It was you doing those things. Look at Deuteronomy, look at chapter 6, and we'll go 24 and 25. And it says, And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good, for our, for our good always, that he might preserve us alive <clears throat> as it is. As is it is at this day. 25. And it shall be, and this is what I want to talk about today in time past. And it shall be our what? Can you say that word for me? Righteousness. There was a degree of righteousness. 
righteousness in performing that law and keeping that law. We're still dealing with it today. A lot of people have pride in performing and keeping that law. But there was a degree of righteousness. Amen? Whenever there's controversy, there's two different sides who basically are taking a certain amount of information and saying, well, this is what we're supposed to do. And we see here in the text, when you write the divine, you're going to see something different about righteousness. Yes, there was a degree of righteousness with that law in time past, but we're going to see it but now is something different. Or you obtain it a different way. 25, and it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. Keep that in mind. Let's go to what Paul calls but now, presently, the dispensation of grace. After the what? After the cross. Who's, who's thankful that things change after the cross? Who's thankful? Who wanted to be under that law? Not me. Mm -hmm. Not me. Things change. Uh, this, this particular grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace, getting what we don't deserve. Because of the cross, God can now operate in a new and a different way unique way. It's about His grace. And now, this righteousness is not even going to be our righteousness like it was for Israel. It's going to be Jesus Christ's righteousness. Which one would you rather have? Your righteousness or Jesus' righteousness? Stupid question. Stupid question. Stupid question. <laughs> Also in the but now, we are the body of Christ. The Apostle Paul is the first member of that body, Jesus Christ, from heaven, the resurrected Jesus, gives him this due time revelation. He was his number one enemy, Paul was. And Christ saves him by grace and faith plus no works. Paul becomes his number one preacher, his minister, his apostle. He writes more book of the Holy Bible than any other writer. Jesus Christ continued to appear and give Paul his revelation. Paul writes the Romans through Philemon, and Paul also refers to it as the mystery. Somebody said mystery. If you study the Bible from cover to cover, when you get to Paul's 13 books, you're going to say, hmm, something's changed. The mystery, which is opposite of opposite prophecy. Different gospels in the Bible. The gospel of the kingdom. John preached it. Jesus Christ preached it. The disciple preached it. And then it went to the gospel of the circumcision. Now it's the gospel of the uncircumcision and the gospel of grace. After the rapture, the body of Christ will be taken. The Lord Jesus descends from heaven. With the shout, with the trump, the body of Christ, we are raised and we go to the heavenly places. Some get the reward, some suffer loss. I was on that track for many years of just being saved and not getting the reward because 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10-15, through 15, I was not building upon Paul's foundation. Paul says, I am as a wise master builder. God chose him to bring in this dispensation of grace to build upon it. And today, this is how God is operating in the dispensation of grace. He's saving individual sinners by grace and faith based upon the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. The gospel for today, the death, burial, and the resurrection. When that rapture happens, we go to the judgment seat, some get the rewards, some stuff lost. But hey, you're still saved. But you could have had the reward, but you on the earth, you, you didn't take heed how you built upon the foundation. 
shortly after the, the seven year tribulation that began to happen, we, we studied that here at our assembly. We studied about the Antichrist, how he was the, the, the man of sin and the son of perdition. We, we studied that. For seven years, he's got power and authority, and the whole world is following him. And the prayer is for those who are in that time is, thy kingdom come, and the Lord Jesus Christ, that stone, and, and it talks about in Daniel, he does come. He does build his kingdom. He, he, his kingdom is on the earth, and he reigns with the rod. For a thousand years, the disciples are there. They, they are his number one agency. The gospel of the kingdom is preached all over the world. The knowledge of God is shared all over the world. Satan is thrown into that bottomless pit for a thousand years. He can't tempt anyone. He can't deceive anyone. A seal is put about his mouth. Great time to be alive. But then for some reason, as you read in Revelation chapter 20, he is released out of hell. He doesn't repent. He goes around and deceives the nations. They come against God in that final judgment, the great white throne. Everyone who's in hell, who's going to be, they're going to be thrown back in there, but they'll get a chance to have their day in court. The books will be open, and they are judged according to their works. Instead of them trusting Christ and the work that he did, they're going to pay for their own sins based on their own works throughout eternity. After that great white judgment, Paul talks about a new heaven and a new earth, and that's when we step into all eternity. So I share with you Deuteronomy that that law, that was a certain degree of righteousness, it was their righteousness, but today in the dispensation of grace, turn with me to the book of uh, Romans, let's look at Romans chapter 10, and you can see the dispensational change, the dispensational change. If you look at Romans chapter 10, let's start at verse 1. Now, we, we are get, we're fastly approaching Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11. We're, at, we're going to finish Romans chapter 7 in our second session today. But when we get to 8, uh, it's going to be great. But then 9, 10, and 11 is basically addressing the nation of Israel, the Jews. How do I know that? Well, hold your hand verse chapter 10, go to verse 9. Paul is telling you, he's telling you who he's going to be addressing in chapters 9, chapter 10, and chapter 11. Look at Romans chapter 9, verse 1. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bear me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Why do you have this sorrow, Paul? Why do you have this heaviness? Keep reading. For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my who? Brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Paul, Jesus Christ through Paul is going to address the Jews, the Hebrew people, the Israelites, the nation of Israel. Romans chapter 9, Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 11. He's going to tell you about their past, their present, and their future. Go to, go to chapter 10. Chapter 10, verse 1. We're going to talk about this righteousness that we read about in earlier in time past in Deuteronomy. Romans chapter 10, look at verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel. Do you see who, he's a, who he is talking to? Do you see who his concern is? He's shifting gears, as you, as you will. Romans chapter 1 through 8, it's about the body of Christ, these new things that, that has happened, what Christ has done, and, and the, the, the faith of Christ, and, and all our guilty, and, and, and just the propitiation, and all those things. Now he switches gears, and he's going to address the nation of Israel, which is, which is right, because they are still God's people. He, he, he will still keep his promises with them, but today... During the dispensation of grace, 
Bible says they were set aside. They were set aside. If you were watching a movie, it was like a pause button on their prophetic program. Without Paul's revelation, without Paul's 13 books, the Bible will look like this on a timeline. But there was an interruption of the prophetic program. There was an interruption. And in this interruption, this but now, the dispensation of grace, we're going to see here that the righteousness, the degree of righteousness that they had in time past, we got something far better in today's but now. So his, his heart's desire and prayers to Israel, to God for Israel, is that they might be what? Saved. Now let's just, let's, just, let's just put our minds together for a second. Most Jews today, what do they believe about Jesus? Let's be honest. He wasn't the son of God. They don't believe he was the son of God. Most of them don't believe that. And we're just being honest. So Paul's saying his heart's desire and his prayer to God for Israel is that they might be what? How can you get saved if you don't believe that Jesus was who he said? Amen. And it's not a thing where we're looking down and we're bashing. No, we're, I'm like Paul. I want to see everybody get saved. But the word says Jesus is the the way, the the truth, and the life. And Paul is addressing in this dispensation his prayer to God is for Israel that they might be saved. Verse two. For I bear the record that they have zeal of God. Zeal is good. Zeal is great. But there's a but. But not according to what? Knowledge. knowledge. Right in the body of the word of truth, there is a knowledge that we now have that in time past they did not have. Paul said it was kept secret since the world began. He said, I bear the record that they have zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's what? <laughs> Remember how we read in Deuteronomy? Do those commandments and it will be their what? Righteousness. Their righteousness. That was their righteousness. Now Paul is talking about whose righteousness? God's. God's. Let me ask another stupid question. Which righteousness do you want? Theirs or God's? Stupid question. <laughs> For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. I believe that you are here today because you personally, individually want to submit yourselves under the righteousness of who? God. I hope that's why you're here. <clears throat> or you can be like the other churches and, and try to get back into the commandments. <laughs> Put themselves under the law and have that small degree of their righteousness. Feels good. It feels good to say, oh, look what I've done. I, I have a certain degree of righteousness. I forgot to put this camera on. I'm sorry. <laughs> Give me one second. Let me record. But it is God's righteousness. Look at verse 4. Now, if you can't see the dispensational change on this next verse, I don't know what to say. Look at verse 4. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. For Christ is the end of the law for to everyone that what? Isn't that amazing? To 
Look at the Bible through the lens of rightly dividing. There was a time and time past where the commandments was their righteousness. And now we see because of Christ, because of the cross, that began the end of the what? Let me reread it. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Today in the dispensation of grace, God is banking on, God is counting on you hearing the gospel, you reading the gospel and believing it. To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for what? Righteousness. Let's go to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Is this making any sense? Do you see why I'm using this for, for a dispensational example of how when you're studying the Bible, it's very important to rightly divide it or else you could be trying to establish your own righteousness, which the scripture said in Deuteronomy, that's what God wanted you to do at that time. Can I get an amen? <laughs> and we all agree that God's righteousness is better than the righteousness that we could establish by trying to keep some of that 600 plus laws. Romans chapter 3, let's take a look at verse 19. And we'll take a quick break and we'll come back and we're going to get back into, we're going to finish Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 3, if you look at verse 19, it reads, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law. Who was under the law? The Jews, the nation of Israel. God gave it to Moses and they were under it. That every mouth may be stopped, which means shut up. <laughs> and all the world may become guilty before God. The whole world is guilty when it comes to God's standard of perfection. Do we all agree? E even the Pope and even Mary were guilty before God, right? Even grandma and granddad. Even your best friend, right? The whole world guilty before God. You might look good to me, Keisha, but According to God, guilty. Verse 20, therefore, therefore, as we further explanation, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of what? Sin. See, the problem is not the law. The law is holy, it's good, it's righteous. The problem was indwelling sin, and wait till we get to Romans 7. It's going to be fun. <laughs> Verse 21. But now. Somebody say, but now. But now. Dispensational change. But now. Currently speaking. Romans through Philemon. The dispensation of grace. The mystery program. But now. The righteousness of God without the what? The law is manifested. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Dispensational change. This is unheard of. That phrase right there. But now the righteousness of God without the law. They would have looked at you like you were crazy if you would have said that in time past. Verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. In closing our, our, our short, rightly dividing session one, we we're just looking at one word, righteousness. It meant something different in time past. It means something different in, in the but now in the dispensation of grace backed by 
the finished cross work. Questions, comments on rightly dividing the scriptures. Questions, comments. Yeah, Paul says, let no man judge you, even concerning the Sabbath. Okay, and the law, it's not that the law was a bad thing, it was just that we could never keep it. But we're still supposed to strive to, right? Like, even though we can't keep it, we still, like, as we become closer to Christ and God, we want to do more of that. Like, we still want to do more of that. Well, I would say yes and no. Because there's some things that you can't, when you're rightly divided, there's some things you couldn't do both. You could not be uncircumcised and circumcised. There are some things where you couldn't, but as far as direction, the law was good. But I think the key is the purpose of the law. Back then, they actually had to do it for righteousness. Today, we don't do it for, for righteousness. It's, we actually establish the law, and we actually have new commandments. Turn with me. Really quick to 1 Corinthians. What was it? 2 Corinthians. I'll find it. Chapter 14. Yeah, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. <clears throat> and if you look at, I'll wait for everyone to get it. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And look at verse 37. When you got it, say amen. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge, acknowledge, act upon the knowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Jesus Christ told Paul to write this. And so Paul is saying, if you think you're a prophet or spiritual, acknowledge the things that I write. We can find what Paul wrote, Romans through Philemon. And act upon this knowledge. Acknowledge, act upon it. And then he says, let him acknowledge that the things that I write, Paul is not Moses. <clears throat> God gave Moses some things and then Moses went on to write those laws, right? Leviticus, all those. Paul, uh, Moses wrote those. But Paul says, let me acknowledge the things that I write are the what? The commandments. We got some new commandments. We have a new leader. It's Jesus Christ through Paul. In scripture, only Jesus Christ and Paul says, follow me. Only two to say is follow me. So if we're following Paul, he's saying the things that I write are the commandments of the Lord in the dispensation of grace? We got some new commandments. We have a new leader, a new program. And I thought I saw, I thought I saw something go like this. Yeah, we establish it. And when we get to Romans 13, oh, I'll get your hand. Paul's going to show you how the first five of the Ten Commandments, it's loving God and then loving your neighbor. Paul's going to address that in Romans 13, too. It's going to be great. Go ahead. Yes.
When, when we get to Romans 7 in our second session, we're going to talk about this Christian walk and how uh, Paul talks about the old man or the old woman, the new man, and then the whole man. And so we're going to see how we do have a choice each and every day. But I can guarantee you, if you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I can guarantee you that according to the word of God. Fulfilling the law. We establish the law. Yeah. Right. Right. And actually not us, but the old man will. Wait, wait till we get it. Let's take a quick break and we're gonna we're gonna talk about that. And it's it's such an eye opener. So yeah, let's let's pray. We'll take a quick break. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this short time in your word. Bless us to come back here in a couple minutes and get even deeper in Romans chapter 7. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're also going to hit Romans chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. And the question is, do you think Paul is rejoicing in the truth of Romans chapter 8, verse 1 and 2, while experiencing Romans chapter 7, verses 15 to 25. I'll ask that question again. Do, do you think that Paul is rejoicing in the truth of Romans chapter 8, verse 1 and 2, while experiencing Romans chapter 7, verse 15 to 25? I'm going to start at verse 15 and think about this. I'm, we're going to unpack it, but who do you think Paul is referring to? The old man, the new man, or the whole man? Now, I want to be upfront with you. This is a very difficult passage because it's so much in there. Who studied Shakespeare? Anybody? What kind of terminology do they use to thou, Romeo, Roma? Where art thou? This is almost the same type of sort of looking for vernacular, wording, terminology. They said that the English language at that time was at the height of advancement or whatever. Mm -hmm. So let's look at this. Romans chapter 7, verse 15. Every time I read it, I always say, I, it, it, it confuses me every time. <laughs> For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my, of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind I myself serve the law of God, 
but with the flesh, the law of sin. It's a lot to unpack. Questions to ponder. Think about your Christian walk. Does not the old nature in your Oh, oh, does not the old nature in you constantly strive to gain control? Do you have no problem at all with the old man? Have you consistently overcome the flesh in your experiences as a Christian? Do you not honestly have to confess with Paul that to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Have you found out how to consistently perform the good and overcome the evil? Let's unpack this. If you look at verse 18, it says in verse 18, the words in me obviously refer to the old man. Let's read 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh. So Paul is now addressing the flesh when he says in me, which is the old man. Somebody say old man. That is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. So we know that in our flesh, which is our bodies, the physical, corrupt, carnal nature dwells no good things, no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform which that is good, I find not. He immediately explains that in the flesh that dwelleth no good thing. Verse 15, let's read that. Verse 15, for that which I do, for that which I do, I allow not. For that what I would, that do I not, but what I hate, that do I. The words I allow not and I hate clearly refer to the new man. See, the new man hates to do wrong. The old man, there's nothing good dwelling in it, so the, the, the old man always wants to do what is wrong. In verse 17, the word sin that dwelleth in me must, of course, be associated with the old man. But the me in which the sin dwells is the whole man. The whole man is both the new man and the old man put together, or the man as a whole. While the word I in it is no more I, that do it clearly refers to the new man. Look at verse 21. 21 reads, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. The phrase evil is present with me might at first seem to mean the e that evil is at hand to tempt. But the preceding verse in verse 20 followed by the words, I find then a law indicates that in 21, he speaks of sin in him. Why then does he use the term present with me? The explanation is found in the identity of the person referred to here. The I that would do good is obviously the new man and the old man who does evil is present with him. The whole is both. The whole is both. The whole man is the new man and the old man together. Both the old and the new residing in the whole man. Let me just pause. In your Christian walk, I've heard people say, I'm not growing in Christ. I'm a hypocrite. I can't do it. I not understanding when they listen to the Apostle Paul, when they rightly divide, we now have a choice. There's the old man, which is corrupt. In the body dwelleth no good things. 
or the spirit man. Now, see, the spirit man was created when we talk about that word regeneration in Titus. I'm going to give you the solution here in just a minute. But the solution is when Christ died for our sins, the old man was supposed to die positionally. The new man was created and now we're supposed to walk in the spirit. If you walk in the old man, watch out. Christians didn't understand. My old friends, they didn't understand that they were walking in that old man. Let me give you the solutions here. Go to Colossians chapter 3, verse 10. Get Colossians 3, verse 10. Get Romans chapter 8, verse 16. Does this make any sense so far? Okay. Colossians chapter 3, verse 10 says, Ye have put on the what? The new man. There, there it is. A lot of pastors are not preaching this. A lot of churches are not preaching this. There, there's a new, a new man is created in Christ Jesus. <laughs> put ye on, ye have put on the new man, which is renewed in the what? In the what? In the knowledge. This new man is renewed in the knowledge, the understanding, our mind, after the image of him that created him. Go to Romans chapter 8, verse 16. Romans chapter 8, verse 16. When you got it, say amen. See, this new man, it, 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 it's, it's a spiritual, it's, it's, spirit, it's the spirit, a new spirit. Romans chapter 8, verse 16 says, the spirit, capital S, that's the Holy Spirit, right? Right? The spirit itself beareth witness with our what? Spirit, lowercase, that we are the children of God. I want to encourage you this morning. The more you study God's word, the more you build up your spiritual man. And if you build up that spiritual man, that spiritual man will dominate. Somebody say dominate. The old man. Remember how we read in Romans chapter 6 that the, 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 the body of spirit is, let's just turn to it. Look at Romans chapter 6. Look at Romans chapter 6, look at verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be what? Destroyed. That old man is destroyed, according to God. That henceforth we shall not serve sin. Christ on the cross destroyed that old man. Go to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and if you will look at verse 16, and it reads, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man, what, perish. What's the hour, man? Yeah. Go to the gym all you want, lift all the weights, eat right, do all the things you can do, but this old man is going to what? Paris. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. dust to dust. Though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed what? Oh, my Lord, I feel like preaching. I really feel like preaching old school. Day by day, step by step. Day by day, step 
by step. Build that spiritual man. Don't get frustrated with yourself. Don't beat yourself up. Amen. Get into the word of God. And begin to dominate that flesh. You won't get that glorified, perfect body until the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. And then Paul says we'll be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. Amen. Until then, say it with me. Day by day. Step by step. And and then like what Paul says here, go go to Philippians Go to Philippians. Well, what's the goal? What's, what's, what's the goal? What's, what's, what's the motivation? Well, God's grace is the motivation. God's grace should motivate you. But you got something to shoot for here. Look at Philippians chapter 3. If you go to verse 14, and it says, Paul says, I press toward the what? Mark. Day by day. Step by step. Can I get one amen? amen. <laughs> I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Build up this spiritual man. That is the solution. True believers come to Christ not to be free to sin but to be delivered from sin. Should I say it again? Should I say it again? True believers come to Christ not to be free to sin, but to be delivered from sin. Their minds, once alienated from God by sin, have now been renewed as they have been reconciled to God. I sung a little song today, Change, Transform My Mind, Conform Me. Look at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, if you will. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, and we'll look at verse 20 and 21. And it reads, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in the earth or things in heaven, and you, somebody say, and you, that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind, by wicked works, yet now have he reconciled. It is a mind that that's where the battle is. The devil wants to attack your mind. But thank God, through his word, we can have a renewed mind. Amen. Romans chapter 12 talks about, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And concerning the evil in us, the old uh, Adam Uh, nature, corrupt nature, he says, put off the old man, which is corrupt, according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Look at that, uh, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, real quick, real quick. Ephesians chapter 4, if you look at verse 22. Ephesians chapter 4, look at verse 22. That ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, put that off, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your what? Mind. Look at 24. Somebody read it for me. Put on the who? Remember, we talked about you got the new man and the old man together residing in the whole man. Put off the old, put on the new. Keep going, brother. All right. Remember, we already talked about Romans 12. 
Let's go back to uh, Romans chapter 7. Let's wrap this thing up. <clears throat> Romans chapter 7, 24. It says, oh, wretched man that I am. Do you realize if you put yourself under the law, Brother Eric, if you tried to perform that 600 plus y'all laws, you'll be a mess. <laughs> So many churches are putting themselves under the law and their life is a mess. They throw in the towel. I've seen it. Performing, 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 performing. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, somebody say the mind, that, mani that mind of, of Christ, that spirit, that new man, so that with the mind I serve the law of God, but the flesh, the law of what? Sin. And I'm encouraging you to build up the spiritual new man so that he dominates or she dominates the old man. Last scripture of the day, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. There is victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is well worth it. I know it's a war of the mind, but it is well worth it. And we already have the victory. Say that with me. We already have the victory. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you look at verse 57, it reads, but thanks be to God. Somebody say, thanks be to God. Sometimes you just don't thank God for the material things. You thank him for just this warfare, knowing that we, were, we are victorious. I thank God that I'm not the same Jim Beam. I thank God for the new man. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't know who he is, if you don't know what he accomplished for you on the cross, you could be watching on YouTube if you know in your heart and your mind that you are a sinner, you know you've sinned. We've all sinned. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is a Savior who can save you. His name is Jesus. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8 through 10, it says, But God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. For us. Jesus Christ came down here. He lived the perfect life. He kept the law perfectly. But the good news committed to Paul is that his death was our death if we believe in him. He was buried and he rose again on the third day. That is the good news of the gospel that he can forgive you your sins and he can promise you eternal life. And that's the question. Are you saved? Saved from what? Saved from the wrath that is to come. Saved from the debt and the penalty of your sins. The blood of Jesus can cleanse you. It's a free gift. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. By faith, just believing that. No works. No religious works. Trust in him as your all-sufficient Savior. If you believe that, if you have faith in that, the Bible declares you saved. The Bible declares you righteous. And you are justified through the eyes of God. We want to welcome you to our family, to the family of God. If you don't have a local assembly, 
feel free to give me a call or email and we could try to find a local assembly for you that's going to preach and teach the truth, the rightly divided truth. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for this first Sunday of 2022. Lord, we trust that your word will sustain us. Your word has already given us the victory. And we ask it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we all said together, amen.